Hello, good morning. Welcome to our 9 a.m. service. Welcome to St. Michael Le Belfry. It's wonderful to be with you this morning, both in person and with those of you watching at home as well. My name's Mike. I'm one of the curates here at the Belfry, and I'm going to be leading us through the service with... Jacob. Nice to meet you. So I'm your evangelism intern here at the Belfry, and indeed a very warm welcome from me too. Lovely. Um, so Jacob, it's, uh, it's lovely to have you here with us this morning. I nearly forgot my bit. Jacob's actually, it's his first time le leading, and I'm the one who made the first mistake. So there you go. Nice. Settle in. Um, so it's, it's, uh, like I say, it's wonderful to be with you this morning. We're going to be continuing with our series on making disciples, looking at the second of our uh, five kind of uh, sections of the roadmap. Um, and we're looking this morning at for the benefit of the outsider. And Vicky Earl, um, one of our other curates, is going to be speaking to us about that as well. Pete and the team are going to be leading us in sung worship. Um, and we've got Ruth Somerville is going to come and talk to us a little bit about yo-yo and give us an update on that and help uh, lead us in our prayers this morning too. So lots coming up this morning. Amazing. So just to get you guys talking, we've got a welcome question for you. For the guys at home, this is a good opportunity to get in the chat function on the YouTube. Just something to discuss whilst we go through the health and safety stuff at the start. Um, so the question is, so people always think uh, that Jonah was eaten by a whale, but actually the Bible tells us that it's just a big fish. So we don't really know that it's a whale for sure. Um, so to do with that, uh, this is a case of mistaken identity. Uh, so it was a big fish. Uh, so what is your best story of mistaken identity? Have a little chat in your pews. Turn around, talk to the people next to you. Biggest issue of mistaken identity. Uh, for me, uh, I had quite a funny one. Um, so this was actually the other way around. I didn't have my own identity mistaken. I actually mistook someone else's. So when I was very little, uh, and I was about sort of bum height to my mum, uh, when she used to pick me up from school, I used to hug her around that area, uh, and I ended up hugging the wrong woman from behind, and she turned around. She's like, oh, that's not my child. Uh, so that was nice and fun. Uh, so have a little chat <laughs> in your views about what, what yours was. So I'm going to draw us uh, back together. If you're at home, do keep uh, sharing about what your cases of mistaken identity are. Do put them in the chat. We'll be chatting with people who are at home watching with you. Uh, while you do that, I'm going to go through some of our health and safety announcements, as always. So thank you so much to everyone for wearing your masks, for following those rules. Um, please do keep wearing those throughout the whole service, unless, of course, you have an exemption for some reason. Um, the toilets are behind me, to my right, your left. Uh, if you do need those, please do go down what I believe is the north aisle. I recently learned the points of the compass, so I can call it the north aisle now in an official manner. Uh, this service is being live streamed, as we've kind of mentioned. Um, if that is an issue for you, uh, then do let someone know, one of the stewards who kind of welcomed you in, or someone wearing a lanyard, and we can help you out with that and help you avoid the cameras and things. Um, if you have any questions at all, basically ask someone wearing a lanyard they should be able to help you. Amazing. So let's get started with our service. Uh, just to start us off, why don't we hear the words of this psalm? It's Psalm 84, verses 1 to 4, if you'd like to follow along. So it says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. And now just for our opening prayer. God of truth, help us to keep your law of love and to walk in ways of wisdom, that we may find true life in Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. 
Amen. So if you'd like to stand, we're going to begin uh, with our first song of worship. Lord, the lights of your love is shining in the midst of the dark is shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us, set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me, shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory, lay spirit, blaze, set Come to your awesome presence from the shadows into your radiance by your blood. I may enter your brightness, search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me, shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine. Changing from glory to glory, mirrored here, may our lives tell your story. Shine on me, shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine. As we stay uh, standing together, we're going to come to that point in our service where we think about the things that we've done wrong this week, about the ways we've gone astray from God's plan in our life, and we're going to confess our sins to God. So some words are going to appear on the screen, and we're going to say them together. Almighty God, long-suffering and of great goodness, I confess to you, I confess with my whole heart my neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments, my wrongdoing, thinking, and speaking, the hurts I have done to others, and the good I have left undone. O oh God, forgive me, for I have sinned against you, and raise me to newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, sure in the forgiveness of God, knowing that he forgives everyone who truly repents, who truly turns back towards him and says sorry for what they've done wrong, hear these words of the absolution. So may the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sin. Heal and strengthen you by his spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. 
Amen. So let's continue to worship. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by every stone Messiah still and all You 
I'm on? Now I'm on. Amazing. So do be seated if you can. Uh, so the reading for this week comes from Jonah chapter 3, uh, and I'm going to read the whole thing. Uh, so please do uh, 
scroll there if you'd like to. So Jonah chapter 3, entitled Jonah Goes to Nineveh. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by doing a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so now we've come to our time in our service where we're going to hear uh, a word. Uh, so I'm going to invite Vicky up uh, to come and share that with us. And Vicky, if it's okay, I'm just going to pray for you just before you do that. So Father God, we thank you so much for our great friend and sister in Christ, Vicky. And we do just pray, Lord God, will you freshly pour out your spirit on her, give her a fresh anointing this morning, the gift of teaching that her mouth might open, but your words might come out. Lord God, will the body of Christ here in you be edified by the words of this amazing woman of God. And we thank you, Lord God, for all that she has so diligently prepared for us today. Bless us and speak to us as Vicky speaks, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for praying. Hello, everybody. It's really good to see you. I hope you've been enjoying the sun. Yep. <laughs> um, I went to the beach on Friday, which was very exciting, and it was actually warm still at the beach, which was great joy. But as we just um, read this passage from Jonah, and I wonder if you've ever found yourself running away from God, or maybe are you running away from him right now? Following God's call on my life has been very costly, but has ultimately always been the most life-giving choices that I could have made. But there have been so many times in my life where my first reaction to God's call, to the things that maybe God is asking me to do, has been very dismissive. I don't know if you can relate to that. I remember when I was around 19 and I was at university and uh, I went on a summer evangelism course in London. Uh, with a, it was a big church um, there. And in the afternoon, everybody would go out to different parts of the city and the surrounding areas to do street evangelism. Now, if you don't know what street evangelism is, it's basically telling people about Jesus on the street. And uh, I confess, I find it very scary. Uh, it's not my place of comfort or uh, preference when it comes to evangelism, but there I was doing it. And I was talking to one of the leaders of uh, the church that was running this course, and they were planting churches across London and the surrounding areas. And I said to him, you guys should plant a church in the place where I was studying for university. And he said to me, no, we shouldn't. You should plant a church. And inside, I thought to myself, what a strange and ridiculous thing to say to me. Clearly, I'm never going to plant a church, and I'm not going to plant a church in the place where I was living at the time. And five years later, with a team, I did plant a church in that place. And I remembered this thing that this church leader had said to me, which at the time seemed so strange, and I was so dismissive of it, but obviously was God speaking to me. 
And I've got other stories in my life where I've had a similar response to things that God has asked me to do, a similar initial response. And so often, our thoughts and our ways are not God's thoughts and ways. And there's this continual journey to discover what God thinks about things and how God does things. And he does things so much better than we do, but sometimes we find the way that he goes about things difficult. And Jonah is a great book to help us reflect on this. And there could be all kinds of reasons we might run away from God. And the Bible has stories about people feeling inadequate or finding the message too harsh or fearing for their lives. But Jonah's running away from God is probably the biggest example we have of extravagant running away, and for very different reasons to the ones that I've just listed. So what do we know about Jonah? Well, this particular book is one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament and is the most unique of all the prophetic material. You know, most of the prophets are a series of what we called oracles where God is speaking out against the behavior of the Israelites or other foreign nations. But Jonah isn't really like that. It's more of a narrative, a story about the prophet. And also, unlike the other prophetic books, it's, also, it's not steeped in history. We don't know when the word of God came to Jonah, like it says in a lot of the other prophetic books. And this has led to much debate among scholars around whether or not this book is referring to a historical event or whether it was a kind of parable that was used to teach the ways of God to the Israelites. But for the purpose of today, we're going to imagine that Jonah to be the prophet who was mentioned in 2 Kings 14, verse 25. So feel free to check that verse out if you want to. And he conducted his ministry at the same time as Amos. But unlike Amos, Jonah had a politics of nationalism. And he encouraged Israel to take back its land and widen its borders after the devastating invasion of the Assyrians. And they were successful in that. And domination and destruction by the Assyrians is what we need to be aware of most as we're reading this story. Nineveh was Assyria's capital city. And basically, God was asking Jonah, someone who believed in Israeli nationalism and expansion, to go to their worst enemy, who had caused them so much devastation and pain, and call them to repentance. And so what was Jonah's response? And early on in the book, um, from what we read today, we basically read about how he goes and buys a ticket to the furthest place he could get to, to get away from Nineveh, as far away from Nineveh as was possible. And so he booked this ticket on a a ship to Tarshish to get away from God. Which is funny, isn't it? Because <laughs> maybe Jonah's forgotten that God isn't confined like us to human, uh, like us humans, to a geographical area. Clearly, God is going to go along on this little adventure with Jonah. And you know, just as I was preparing for today, it reminded me of um, a story that I heard when I was a child. Something that actually, a real story that happened in that that a man who, when I was a child, he was a very well-known pastor, and he'd been brought up in a Christian family. But as a young man, he had a season where he kind of turned his back on God, and his parents and lots of people were praying for him. And every time he went drinking in various pubs, at the end of the night, when he was a little bit worse for wear, there would always be a Christian who ended up talking to him. It was like, I just can't get away from God, no matter how hard he tried. And so Jonah's on the ship, and God's trying to get his attention. And maybe God's trying to get our attention this morning. 
So he sends a great wind, which causes a great storm, which meant the ship was barely hanging on. And it appears that it might break up. And so, understandably, the sailors were afraid. They threw their belongings overboard and cried out to their gods. But where was Jonah? He was fast asleep at the bottom of the ship. And the sailor was shocked to find him asleep and told him what was going on and demanded that he call on his God to save them. And so they decided to cast lots to find out who on this ship has caused this calamity. And the lot fell to Jonah. And so Jonah told them that he was a Hebrew who feared the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And he also told them, he was very honest, that he was running away from God. And so the sailors were afraid and they were like, how could you do this to us? How could you put our lives at risk? And so Jonah offered, you know, you can throw me overboard. And so the sailors were a bit like, can we do that? And so they decided to pray to Jonah's God. And so they threw him overboard. And then the sea calmed. And whilst Jonah was running away from God, he had his first converts, the sailors. You know, if you read 1 verse 16, it says, Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. It's amazing, isn't it, that even when we're running away from God, God can still be using us like he did in this situation. And so then God, in his grace and kindness, doesn't leave Jonah to drown in the sea, but sends a big fish to eat him, to give him a few days of reflection, three days and three nights to be precise. And so Jonah prays, he sorts himself out with God, and he stops running away. And so God tells the fish to vomit him out onto dry land. And then God asks him again, go to Nineveh. And tell them to repent. This time, Jonah is obedient to God. But yet, you know, it kind of feels like, I don't know whether he's putting a massive amount of effort into it. He just goes around simply saying, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And basically, as Jacob read to us, the king of Assyria, who in other parts of the Bible is talked about being a, doing great acts of evil, is now calling his city to repent, um, to use the traditional sign of this with sackcloth and ash, in the hope that God might change his mind and not destroy their city. And th- 3 verse 10 says, When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, Then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. And so all in all, this has to be the most successful mission trip that there has ever been. Basically, Jonah had a one-sentence message, and the whole city repented. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? (laughs) But that's not how Jonah saw it. Now, is there anyone you would consider your enemy? Maybe someone who's done you or someone you love great harm. Or it might even be someone you know at a distance who's caused great harm to your people because of decisions they've made. Or maybe it's even a group of people who you have observed living in a way which brings destruction. How would you feel if God told you that if they repent, they would be completely forgiven, no harm would come to them, treated the same way as you? It might be a bit like if we were back in the Second World War, God telling us to go and preach to the Nazis. And Jonah was angry. 4 verse 2 to 4 says, he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall, 
by fleeing to Tarshish, I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to live, uh, to die, sorry, than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? I wonder if we've ever felt that way, that we've seen God be so compassionate and gracious to individuals or groups. And if we're honest, we just feel angry about it, just feel like it's not fair. Maybe we might want to just consider who have we discounted? Who, if we're honest, we, we don't really want to join us, even as a church, and mess it up. Maybe we feel comfortable knowing lots of people in the church, being in a Belfie group with people we've been friends with for years. Maybe we're comfortable with the way things are done around here. And we don't want new people, if we're really honest, to come in and mess it up. I think that's something that probably churches around the country wrestle with off and on all the time. And Jesus had a habit of hanging out with people that many people would see as those who would mess things up from their comfortable religious community. Women, tax collectors, prostitutes, lepers, those who were deemed unclean. And as the church, the representatives of Christ on earth, his hands and feet, we are called to operate for the benefit of the outsider. And the way that God deals with Jonah at the end of this book is he speaks to him through a plant. And this plant grows and he enjoys its shade and then it dies, which makes him sad. And God says to Jonah, but the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is God's heart for humanity, a heart of compassion. And there's an invitation for us to keep on remembering, to join in with God's heart for humanity. You know, we can be concerned with how good our Sunday services are, whether the worship was good, whether the preach was good, whether the children's group or the youth group or whatever it is was good. And we want those ministries to thrive. But actually, the main emphasis isn't in here. It's out there. And, you know, I, I sense as I praying that over the coming months and years, as we've made serving York our main aim, and as we continue with the aim of making disciples, that how we operate in light of that as a church may change things. It might mess things up a little bit. That might make us feel uncomfortable. You know, um, I, I just, I feel... <laughs> kind of stirred by the Holy Spirit to share this, that, you know, I, kn I know we often, for many of you who have been serving God faithfully for many years, I'm sure that you've heard many times people saying that, you know, they feel that God is going to be moving in revival, there's going to be a new move of the Spirit. And many people here, you have seen and stewarded many moves of the Spirit. But I do sense as I pray that there is a new move of the Spirit that is coming. And whenever the Holy Spirit moves, it makes us uncomfortable. It stirs us up a bit. It pushes us where maybe we're not quite sure that we want to go. But we want to be people who get on in it. And it doesn't look like previous 
moves of the Spirit. And so I sense that the Spirit is doing something. The Spirit is stirring things up. The Spirit is pushing us outside of our four walls, as it were. And I'm, I'm coming to an end now, but a few years ago, um, there was a church in America where a bird got into their church building and it, and it couldn't get out of the building. People hadn't seen it was in there trapped. And it died, sadly. And God spoke to them through that, that if they didn't get what God was doing within them as a church, if it didn't get outside the building, then they would die, as it were, as a church. And there's something for us again today to know that the church is for the benefit of the outsider, that the amazing things that God does among us they're not just for us, they're for the people out there. And God is pushing us out there in new ways. And he's doing new things. And he's going to mess us up a little bit. And it's going to be uncomfortable, but it's going to be good. And so let's just take a moment to just listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us individually and as a church and then we're just going to pray. God, we thank you that your ways are not our ways that your thoughts are not our thoughts, that your ways and thoughts are so full of love and compassion, that you're wanting to bless the whole world. And Lord, we thank you for your spirit that moves among us. We thank you for moves of your spirit that have been and moves of your spirit that are coming. And Lord, we pray for us as individuals and as a church as a whole, that you would work in our hearts, that we may be available to you, that we may be obedient, that we may be able to join in with what you're doing, Lord, so that we can see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We can see your name glorified and more people in our city and beyond experiencing your transforming love. So Holy Spirit, get us ready for the things that you're doing in this next season, Lord. Amen. This one's, oh, no, we're back on. Lovely. I thought that was two microphone failures. Um, so, yeah, amen. Thank you so much for that, Vicky. We're going to pray in just a moment, but just to kind of um, uh, not rehash what Vicky said, but to sort of highlight a few bits there. Um, who have we discounted? I was so struck by that question. Who have we discounted in our communities, in our families, people that we walk past every day, who have we discounted that God hasn't discounted? Let's be asking God to keep our eyes open. What are we running away from? What are we scared of? It's kind of a, a similar sort of question. Where is God prompting us to go that we're a little bit uneasy about? And how can we join in with God's heart? How can we join in with what he's doing? How can we get outside of the walls? Like Vicky was saying with that prophetic picture of the bird. How can we get outside of the walls? How can we join in with what God is doing? So one of the ways is through uh, Yo-Yo and the work that Yo-Yo do in schools and with our young people across the city. So Ruth is going to speak to us a little bit and give us an update about Yo-Yo. And then she's going to lead us in our prayers as well.
theme of this service is making disciples for the benefit of the outsider. I'm Ruth Somerville, and I'm a trustee of YoYo, and I've been invited to update you on the work of YoYo. Many of you are no doubt fully aware of what YoYo does, but some of you might not be. YoYo stands for York Schools and Youth Trust, and it aims to work with schools and churches to bring the Christian faith alive. This is a perfect example of the church working for the benefit of the outsider. The vast majority of children and young people in our schools have absolutely no connection to any church. Let's start by watching a short video which explains what YoYo does. York Schools and Youth Trust began in 1996, working with schools and churches to bring the Christian faith alive. We do this through assemblies, lessons, clubs, reflection spaces, and workshops. Over the years, the amount of schools YoYo works in has grown, and now we work in almost every school in York. YoYo schools workers are based in geographical areas across the city enabling us to build relationships with the same children throughout their primary and secondary education. This also allows us to build relationships with school staff and local churches. The local church plays an essential role in supporting the work of YoYo, spiritually, practically and financially enabling us to remain a free resource for schools. YoYo aims to link churches with their local schools and equip volunteers to work alongside the team. We also love to encourage churches to build on their own relationships with local schools. This could involve helping with reading, to taking a weekly assembly, or running a lunchtime club. You can find out more about the work of YoYo by visiting our website, yoyotrust.org.uk. YoYo is 25 years old this year, and we're celebrating. We're going to have a party next month at which the current Lord Mayor, Chris Cullick, known to many of you as he used to be our assistant minister here at the Belfry, will be cutting the cake. This is most appropriate, as he was one of the founding members of YoYo 25 years ago. We've developed this YoYo, this logo, sorry, which will be available on a range of merchandise and the team's t-shirts. The YoYo team is now bigger than it's ever been in its 25 year history. We currently have eight schools workers, who between them visit almost every primary school and secondary school in York. They take assemblies, support lessons, run clubs, and provide resources. And they are ably assisted by volunteers from the churches. During the recent pandemic, YoYo was not able to go into schools. So the school's workers developed a whole host of resources on their website for schools and for families to use at home while they were homeschooling. And these were used by people right across the country and beyond, not just in York. Do have a look at their website when you get home. See some of the assemblies that they've made because they're very creative and great fun. Thank you to those of you who already support YoYo in your prayers, as volunteers, and financially. The Belfry as a church has supported YoYo right from the start 25 years ago through its mission giving. And for that, we're most grateful. We're launching a 25th birthday appeal aiming to raise £25,000, which will ensure that we can continue our work at the current levels for the rest of this year. If you inf feel inspired to contribute towards this, please go to our website. If you'd like to volunteer, just get in touch with me or the YoYo office. And now, let's pray for the work of YoYo. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your faithfulness to YoYo over the last 25 years. Thousands of children and young people have heard all about you 
thanks to Yo-Yo. And we pray that these seeds might bear much fruit into the future. We ask that you would continue to bless the work of Yo-Yo as it seeks to bring the Christian faith alive in our schools. Please give wisdom to the trustees as we work out the best way forward as schools gradually emerge from the pandemic. And we ask for energy, creativity, and enthusiasm for the team as they return to schools, visiting week in and week out. Looking more widely across York, we thank you for all the charities and organizations that are supporting families, individuals, and communities as we move on from the restrictions brought about by coronavirus. Help us here at the Belfry to play our part, whether that's through Love Your Neighbour or as individuals involved in local initiatives. We pray for our city council making difficult decisions about how to spend the money that they have. And we ask your blessing on Chris Cullick as he starts his year in office as the Lord Mayor of York. We pray for wisdom for our government as it leads us out of this pandemic. May they provide adequate resources for the NHS, for education, for the marginalized, and for all who have been adversely affected by the last 15 months. We pray that they would also be generous to those who are outsiders, from welcoming and providing for refugees to supporting those in developing countries. We thank you for the rapid rollout of the vaccine here in the UK. And we pray that those in other countries would also be able to benefit from the protection that the vaccine offers. We cry out to you, Lord, for those currently suffering across the world due to conflict, poverty, natural disasters, and COVID-19. We particularly pray for the Yemen Ethiopia, Syria, Afghanistan, Israel-Palestine, and India, to name but a few. We pray for the G7 leaders who are meeting this week in Cornwall as they make decisions that will affect millions of people across the world. Finally, we pray for those known to us who are suffering in any way, and also for those who are celebrating. Please pray silently now for those known to you. We bring all our prayers together in the words of the Lord's Prayer, which will come onto the screen. So we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Great, thank you for that, Ruth. Um, so we're drawing to the end of our service uh, together now. Do keep praying for Yo-Yo, for all that's going on there. Do remember as well what Vicky was saying about how you can get involved, whether that's with an organization like Yo-Yo uh, or whether that is uh, in some other way as well. Great. Um, so we've got some, uh, some bits of news to give you uh, just as we draw to the, uh, to the end of our service together. So the first one is if, if you're not yet following Jesus, if you'd like to find out more about him or if you'd literally like to make that decision today, you've heard uh, what Vicky said, you've, you've taken part in the service, something is stirred in you, um, then come and talk to us. Jacob and I would love to talk to you after the service. If you're watching at home, do get in contact with us. Uh, you can find one of us on the uh, uh, the staff page of our website. You can get in touch via hello at belfry.org. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to help you start that journey. That's absolutely right. Um, also, just to say, if you are new here in the building, welcome. Fantastic to see you. 
uh, and on the live stream too, if any of you are new. Hi, welcome, nice to see you. Um, for those of you in the building, if you'd like to get in contact with us, come and talk to us, we'll talk emails and, and how to go back and forth. But on the live stream, uh, if you are new and you'd like to connect to us, head to, it is belfry.org forward slash connect uh, to get connected with us. Great. Um, if you need any kind of support, uh, whether that is COVID-related, whether that is just anything at all, there's something going on in your life that you would like support for, be it prayer, be it practical, um, do get in touch with us at uh, belfry.org forward slash pastoral care, um, and we can try and sort something out for you with that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and also just to let you know, if you don't get Friday news, so Friday news is our weekly email. We get a short message from Matthew, and it talks about upcoming events and services that are going on. Uh, but you'd like to get that email, uh, go to hello at belfry.org and we can set that up for you so you can get that every week. And finally, we always like to say a massive thank you to all of you who have been able to continue to give during this time. If you would like to start giving or give a one-off gift um, to help with the work of the church, to help with the mission uh, and, and impacting our local communities, then uh, please do go to belfry.org forward slash giving. Uh, Thank you so much for that. We're going to move into our final time of worship together, but I believe, first of all, Shirley has a testimony that she'd like to share. Good morning, everybody. We were rehearsing last week, and I told a story about this, um, the verse, uh, this Bible verse uh, that uh, the hymn is based on. It's a special verse for me, and um, I told the group the story, and Pete asked, would I share it this week because it was so relevant to what Vicky's been talking about and the theme of our service. Um, it happened a long time ago, it was at late 80s, and I was away with my family on a weekend organized for those who were involved in the worship here at St. Michael's. I was in the singing group and the dancing group. My son Andrew was about three or four and the person leading the weekend um, was Anne Watson, who had an amazing prayer and prophetic ministry. And she wanted to pray for all the children who were there. So Andy was sitting on my knee, which was a miracle in itself, because he very rarely sat quietly on my knee. And she was praying for the children. And, and Andy suddenly became a bit agitated, and he said, oh, mummy, 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 my feet, my feet are all tingling. What's happening? And I, I had to take him out. He was a little distressed by it. And um, afterwards, I spoke to Anne and said, well, what do you think that was about? Um, and his feet being bothered. And the verse that had come to me, and she said the same, was this lovely verse, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news to the poor. And I had no idea what this <laughs> meant, but I held it in my heart um, as a mum. And I suppose as time went on, family life, you know, you forgot about this, but years and years later, when Andy had been to Brazil, as in his gap year, and had decided that that was God's calling on his life, who was working with street children, street boys then. And as a, a lot of you know, of course, uh, you've supported us in prayer um, over all this. It, he decided to live his life in Brazil and work with street children. And this verse was made very real to me as a mum, as I, it helped me to let him go, to do this work that God had called him to. Um, and I did have told this story once before, and it was when the bishop was commissioning Andrew to go and work with the poor in Brazil. And as you know, a lot of you know, uh, Andy now is coming back to the UK to work um, with CMS as an international director of mission. So he will be overseeing all the projects uh, that CMS run over the world. And he's just been commissioned by the Brazilian bishop to come back and continue his work here. So um, this verse is a very special one for me. Thank you.
Yeah, could we stand up? We're going to sing this very old song, but the truth of our God reigns, our God reigns. And, and these wonderful words is still true. How lovely are the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, good news, proclaiming peace, announcing news of happiness, our God reigns, our God reigns. As we come to uh, end our service together, let's hear these words again from Jonah chapter 4 that Vicky told us in, the, uh, in her talk. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. And so the, may, the, may the blessing of this God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now, and as you go into the week ahead. Amen. Have a great week.